Well, good afternoon. Today, I'd like to talk to you about water. <laughs> I'd actually like to get you thinking differently about water. We very rarely think about water, let alone where it comes from. All of us will press a button and we'll get a cup of coffee. We'll put a few coins in a slot and we'll get a bottle of water or some Coke. We may even go to our kitchen and get a drink from the tap. Fresh, clean drinking water is piped to all four corners of our closeted world. On my way here, 37,000 feet up, a lady gives me a cool glass of drinking water for the press of a button. I believe it is for reasons such as this that we don't give water poverty a second glance. Now, as a mechanism for trying to grab your attention, I've spoken with the very organized organizers today, and I've asked them to remove all the water <laughs> from the auditorium. Now, um, rather amazingly, even, if I, even though I pointed out the risks of this quite high-risk strategy, they agreed. So all of you, for the rest of the day, are going to be without water. <laughs> you are. <laughs> now that I have your attention, I'd like to talk to you about water. 1.1 billion people around the world, that's a sixth of the world's population, suffer from lack of access to safe drinking water. Three and a half billion people must suffer the excruciating pain of diarrhea every year. And three and a half million children die every year as a result of drinking contaminated water. Now, I've talked a lot in the past about statistics, but they just don't seem to get through to people. And I think I've worked out why. It's because, A, safe drinking water is all around us, so we don't have to think about it. And B, when we do think about it, the scale of the problem seems too huge to contemplate solving. So we just switch off. Us governments, and aid agencies. Well, today, I'd like to show you that through thinking differently, we can solve the problem. By the way, since I've been speaking, another 3,500 children have died. Three and a half, sorry, 30,000 children, people. Slides are worse. 30,000 people are now suffering with diarrhea, and eight children have just died in that short space of time. I invented Lifesaver because I got angry. I, like most of you, was sitting down the day after Christmas 2004 when I was watching the devastating news of the Asian tsunami as it rolled in, playing out on TV. The days and weeks that followed, people fleeing to the hills, being forced to drink contaminated water or face death. That really stuck with me. Then, a few months later, Hurricane Katrina slammed into the side of America. Okay, I thought, here's a first world country. Let's see what they can do. Day one, nothing. Day two, nothing. Do you know it took five days to get water to the Superdome? In America, people were shooting each other on the streets for TV sets and water. That's when I decided I had to do something. Now, I spent a lot of time in my garage inventing and also in my kitchen, much to the annoyance of my wife. But eventually... After several failed prototypes, I finally came up with this, the Lifesaver bottle. 
Now the science bit. Before Lifesaver, the best hand filters were only capable of filtering down to about 200 nanometers. The smallest bacteria is about 200 nanometers. So a 200 nanometer bacteria is going to get through a 200 nanometer hole. Viruses, on the other hand, are 25 nanometers. So they're definitely going to get through those 200 nanometer holes. Lifesaver pores are 15 nanometers. So nothing's getting through. <laughs> We'd like to see a demo? Yeah. Good. <laughs> I came all this way to give you one. <laughs> now, um, I was speaking to the organizers, and I said, what sort of water would people not like to drink around here? Um, and they said, well, from the tap. I said, well, OK, let's go a little bit different than that. And so we, we went out. And uh, we went out around the, the streets. And we found some water sellers. Um, and we found a guy selling water from a tanker. So this is the water from there. Do you want to drink yet? Now, I got to thinking, though, if you're in the middle of a flood zone, say in Bangladesh, your water doesn't look like this. So I've gone and got a few extra bits and pieces to put in it. Um, I've got some leaves and some other bits and pieces there. Um, I've got some runoff near a sewage plant that I found. Just put that in there. Um, I went to a lake in the city. It was called a lake. I don't know what it was. <laughs> And I got some bits and pieces, and that's from there. Um, some more leaves and stuff. And then I scooped up from the bottom of a river some really nasty stuff. And I thought I'd just put that in there. Because if you're in the flood zone, your water's not nice from a bottle, is it? It's nice and dirty like that. There we go. Okay. There's a bit more rubbish in there. Let's just get that out. Oh, yes. Okay. <laughs> now, let's just stir that up a little bit. Now, this is my dog, Alfie. And Alfie normally gives me a little gift when I go away to presentations like this. <laughs> Fortunately for you, I didn't fancy the conversation at customs. <laughs> However, <laughs> after dinner, I met Rupert. I told Rupert my problem. He was, spoke very good English. He said, uh, I think I can help you with that. So the lovely Rupert gave me a little present. Because if you're in the middle of a flood zone, all your sewers are coming up, right? So this is a present from Rupert. Let's just put that in. There. Come, one of you come. <laughs> Just smell that. Come, come. Smell. You didn't smell it. She's cheating. Smell. Okay. It's real from Rupert. Now we can stir it up. Mmm. Lovely. Okay, now, the Lifesaver bottle works really simply. You just scoop the water up. Today I'm showing you with the Lifesaver bottle, but I could equally as well be doing it with a Lifesaver jerry can, and I'll talk to you about that later. Let's get the PR in, shall we? 
We don't do advertising, we rely on PR. Okay, so I'm going to scoop. That's not dirty enough. Let's do that. Get a bit of Rupert's present in there. There we go. Oh, he's a good boy. I just put that in there. Okay. No filtra no no chemicals, just filtration. Pop the lid on. And I'm just gonna give it a few pumps. Okay? That's all it takes. Now I've got to be quick. You ready? You're not sure, are you? I'm gonna get this guy. Ready? <laughs> that is clean, safe, <laughs> sterile <laughs> drinking water. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Thank you. I think I need a volunteer. Let's get a volunteer. Okay. Come on. You want to go? Yeah. Come on. There you go. Thanks. Have a smell? No smell. Okay. Have a taste. <laughs> sweet. What's it taste of? Sweet. Sweet what? Sweet water. Sweet water? Okay. It's water. <laughs> Thank you. Well done. If anyone wants to go later, they can. <clears throat> Lifesaver products are used by hundreds of thousands of people around the world. For the past four years, I've invented several products, the first of which was the Lifesaver bottle. This can process 6,000 liters of water. The Lifesaver jerry can can process 20,000 liters of water. They've all got replaceable cartridges, so when the system shuts down, you can replace the cartridge and it prevents the user from drinking contaminated water. We make several products, but I'd like to focus today, and we focus on various markets, but I'd like to focus today on the humanitarian and governmental market. And we're working with the governments of Malaysia, the governments of Colombia, the governments of Panama, and we hope soon to be working with the governments of India to bring this sort of technology to people who really need it. Traditionally, in a crisis, what do we do? We ship water. Then, after a few weeks, we set up camps, and people are forced to come into the camps to collect their drinking water. What happens when 20,000 people congregate in a camp? Diseases spread. More resources are required. The problem just becomes self-perpetuating. But by thinking differently and shipping these, people can stay put. They can process their own clean drinking water and they can get on with rebuilding their homes and their lives. Last year, I visited the province of Sindh in Pakistan for the floods. It was amazing. The UN, the Red Cross, the Red Crescent, Oxfam, and lots of other agencies did their usual thing and set up camps. And sure enough, people came into the camps and were fed and watered. And sure enough, cholera and other waterborne diseases started to spread in the camps. However, there were still hundreds of thousands of people stuck out on the causeways. I spoke to a doctor and asked him what he was doing out there. He said he was handing out chlorine and flocculating tablets, but today he had to come and collect them all in again because people had thought they were medicine and were taking them, getting ill, and having to be rushed to hospital. 
He was desperate. We distributed life every jerry cans, about one in every 50, one to 50 people. And we only had to deliver them once. I thought it would take half an hour for people to work out how to use them. It took them two minutes. They scooped up the water from the floods and carried on. Traditional responses to a crisis are less than effective. They're costly and they lead to unintended consequences such as cholera outbreaks and camp dependency. Now, while my goal is to solve the problems in disasters for providing people with clean water, my ultimate goal is to end water poverty. How do you do that, you might be asking? Well, it's quite easy, really. The old thinking has, to be, has been to install infrastructure, the grid, Nelson Mandela. When Nelson Mandela came to power after he had come out of jail in South Africa, he promised that everybody would have clean running water. The euphoria that surrounded his presidency, the momentum for change, and the billions of dollars that were pumped into that economy have still not been enough to solve that problem. For any developing country thinking of installing a national water grid, when they run the numbers on the calculator, they quickly run out of noughts. But there is an answer. Mother Nature has an amazing water delivery system. I call it the world water grid. And part of the world water grid, the most important part, are the clouds. They are phenomenal. They pick the water up from the sea for free. They desalinate it for free. They transport it hundreds of miles, again for free, and dump it on the mountains, rivers, and streams. And where do people live? near water. All we have to do is make it clean. And how do we do that? Well, we can use one of these, the Life Sever Jerry Can. This will clean up to 20,000 litres of water before you need to replace the cartridge. That's good enough for a family of four for three years at a cost of about half a rupee a day. I'd like to show you a video now. <laughs> this video was produced not by us, but, but by an independent aid agency called Operation Blessing, based in Virginia, in America. And they were one of the first to spot the advantages of using this technology in a crisis. Oh, 
prier, je prier. Après ça, on a une soirée, toujours. Je suis même si on devait dire soir encore, je vais prier toujours. Ça va, ma femme, ma femme, ma femme. Et puis, je viens de dire qu'on a fait des mouvements encore, je fais des mouvements encore. Je vais prier. Je suis toujours de dire ça, ça devient de faire mal, plus le plus. Pas de faire nos malades, non, comme si, il y a des gens qui ne vont pas faire bien. Pas de bien cœur content. Comment pas de bien cœur content Parce que pas de l'eau pour le sou. Moi-même, je commence à débuter sous terre. Je suis pour un petit bloc qui est en train de se faire, qui va sortir dans la qui va être en train de avancer. Je suis en train de avec mon gars. Je suis en mettre le bruit pour pour mes pauvres. Là, je suis en train de me faire un petit peu de Je suis en train de me faire un petit peu de places que nous allons sont juste caked in mud. Il y a tellement de rain et de floods qui sont en train de se Opération Blessing, ici en Haïti. Doing our best to combat this cholera epidemic here. Just outside of Luton, this village in the background, you've got the villagers coming this direction. 60 families going to receive jerry cans today. It's an opportunity for them that's potentially going to change their lives. <laughs> Pendant que je prends de l'eau, l'eau super, je mets tellement de galons, elle filtre libre. Je sens que j'ai un espoir. Un espoir. Ça signifie la vie. Signifie. Parce que moi, pour nous, même si on sait que 100 galons, on n'a pas de l'eau encore. Ça signifie la vie pour nous. Parce que c'est plus gros cadeau. Un gros cadeau que bon Dieu te voulait venir faire. C'est un gros travail que bon Dieu te voulait venir faire dans son nom. Là, moi, c'est tellement. Bon, je viens de boire de l'eau, je viens de boire de l'eau. Je suis un galon ça pour tout le monde. Maman, 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 je galon, je ne pas mourir encore. Maman, je galon, je ne pas mourir encore. Merci, merci, opération Blessing. Parce que tu as sauvé la vie, et bon Dieu a toujours bonne opportunité pour toujours bailler, pour toujours bailler à travers le pays. Tout le passé, tout le toujours. Et bon Dieu, toujours bon, tout le monde est béni, 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 and shipping these, mothers and children will no longer have to walk for four hours a day to collect their water. Fathers will no longer have to drink the dirty water from the fields in which they toil. And children can go to school more regularly. This small, almost imperceptible change will have such a profound effect on the economies of the nations, that it's difficult to quantify all of the benefits. The billions of dollars spent on medicine to treat cholera and other waterborne diseases, the millions of hospital beds that will be freed up for operations and procedures that I in the West take for granted, the billions of extra man hours freed from the people now able to work will boost the economies of nations to enviable levels. And as the economies grew, education levels would increase because more people would be able to go to school. So the wealth of families would also too increase. And as history teaches us, over time, the size of the family unit would actually reduce, aiding the spurt in population growth. So with just $8 billion, we could achieve the Millennium Goals target of halving 
the number of people without access to safe drinking water. And water wars could be fought no more. To put that into context, to put the money into context, the British government alone spends about $15 billion a year on humanitarian aid. But why stop at the Millennium Goals? With just $20 billion, everybody can have access to safe drinking water. So the 3.5 billion people that suffer around the world from diarrhea and the 3.5 million kids that die every year will live. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.